hello to a whole lot of new people. I'm Ellie Shore, and I've been running these art salons for over two years now. I welcome all the new people that came tonight that I think are friends of Sam's, students of Sam's, and all of the people that are part of our regular salon experience. I am thrilled at being able to provide these experiences for you and for myself. I've got a crazy passion for contemporary art, and I've kind of set out on a mission to find exciting artists in South Florida, and I find lots of them. Sam has been here for a lot longer than I have. He's a real Floridian and has developed a huge reputation in South Florida as a painter, as a drawer, and as an experimenter, even more in the last few years, doing a lot of very interesting things with digital animation. And a lot of people know him as a teacher. He's teaching at Florida Atlantic University, here at the Armory, I think at the Lighthouse. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Ellie. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening. Tonight, I'm giving a presentation on how drawing has influenced the art making process for me. Some artists use cameras, some artists use clay, but for me, I always go back to drawing as kind of the central theme for the artworks that I make. I like the tactile aspect of drawing. I like being able to hold a pen or charcoal in my hand. I like the connection, the direct connection to the medium. And, and, and the historical relationship is interesting to me as well. Um, the topic is drawing outside, inside, and in between. When you think of outside, I think most people think, oh, he must be talking about landscapes, or he must be talking about drawing something that he sees outside. But actually, what drawing outside means to me is anything that you see outside your body. In other words, all the stuff that we call real is outside. And to me, inside is imagination. It can be abstract. It could have some reference to what goes on in the realistic world. And then in between. The art that's the most interesting to me is when those two concepts come together. When the stuff that you see outside is blended with stuff that you're feeling inside or thinking about what you see, then that's when it starts to become interesting to me. A little bit about my background. I am a native Floridian, so I grew up in West Palm Beach. I'm a uh, second generation Floridian, in fact. My, my father was from here but um, wasn't artistic. I just got the art bug when I was in high school and, and middle school. Loved to draw even back then. Got into plenty of trouble over that. And it's always been something that's uh, been close to my heart. Receptive and projective drawing is the same as inside and outside. Receptive drawing just means you receive from the world outside. Projective drawing means it's coming from inside and you're putting it out there onto the canvas or, or paper. Having grown up in West Palm Beach, this is how I originally saw the Norton Museum. Before it got really fancy, that's actually clouds back there. That's not the new, you know, addition <laughs> that you see. This is, before, this, this is before they made all the additions to the Norton. It was a very simple building like this, and I used to walk down that sidewalk into that door because that was the way into the Norton at that time. Old school. But more importantly than that to me was that if you went around that side of the building, you got into the art school. And in the mid-70s to late-70s, that's where I learned to draw. That's where I first learned to make art was on the other side of that building at the Norton Museum School of Art. Back then it was called Norton Museum and School of Art. They dropped the School of Art somewhere along the line, but that's how the armory was formed. That's another story. Okay, this is Ringling College of Art, and this is about how it looked when I went to school there. It gives you an idea. They've also expanded much like the Norton and have a 30-acre campus now, and it's a hugely successful school. 
And these rooms down there was where I took my first college figure drawing classes. And they weren't air conditioned. <laughs> and it was nine hours a week of figure drawing and three hours a week of just regular still life drawing. No, six hours a week of still life, nine hours a week of regular uh, of figure drawing. Three hours, three days a week in those rooms right there. Okay, some of my earliest influences were Leonardo because I was excited by the line, the way he draws, the way he uses line. That always affected me. I always liked looking at how he approached line. This is another Leonardo. And, and more importantly with this, you can see how when he didn't get the line right and how he blended the figures together, he, it didn't stop him. And he loved to use pen, just like I do. I love to use pen for that reason because of the fact that you can't erase it. You see all the evidence of the marks that you make, always. There's no crutch there. This is Degas, another artist I like a lot. But the reason why I liked him is because he would show me things like this, how the line repeats in the hand. And I learned things about range of motion by looking at guys like him. Toulouse Lautrec. This is the kind of line drawing I like. Very loose, very expressive, almost cartoonish. He was way ahead of his time in that. He almost was a cartoonist. Another Lautrec drawing. Another Lautrec. And I like this because I always like intimate social things where people are together like that, looking, talking to each other. I'm going to go into my own work now, and you, I'm going to start talking about my first drawings with the pen were done at the Dreer Park Zoo and other places before I got to Starbucks. And the reason why I started drawing at Starbucks is because I realized I was spending an inordinate amount of time there already, so I better make it into something productive while I'm there. I was already drinking a lot of coffee. Okay, so this is... Somerset Marmoset, that has a little cute Marmoset sitting in his cage there. That's, that's him writing. That's the Bay City Rollers. That's a little before your time, probably. But I like to take pictures and then caricaturize them just for you know, the experience. This is a, a line drawing from life that I did in figure class. That's a, a model named Noel. And this is all done just directly with no pencil. I never use pencil, so I don't do any underdrawing and then go back over it. These are all just drawn directly from life. So these exaggerations, this type of drawing, of overdrawing, is very interesting to me to do a lot of repetition of line to create form. These are done from observation, probably spending maybe 10 minutes on each, maybe 15 minutes. These are a model named Jeff. Now, at this time, I'm, I'm, I'm using marker and pen together, and I'm trying to get a sense of form. That's, yeah, that's Jeff, Jeff Vargo. He's one of our best models. These drawings are all from observation. And with the exception of this kind of thing, where um, in this, where the head is too large, deliberately too large, I mostly at this time was still trying to figure out how to draw with the pen in a more realistic way. As I always do, I get restless, I get bored. I think that's my best ally in the sense that when I get restless, I know that I need to change. So my figure drawings began to kind of evolve into things that were more radical. Uh, this is a, a landscape done in pen just directly. I went out to Indian Town, and there's the St. Lucie River comes into Indian Town there. And this is just a straightforward line drawing I spent some little bit of time on. OK, this drawing actually has a lot of the early elements of what made me decide I wanted to do animation, where I was doing a lot of overdrawing here and intentionally drawing in this one too, 
where you can see all these gestures with the hand. That was important to me to try to express that energy. OK, this is actually the first drawing I did at Starbucks. This is called Donnie. And Donnie was a kid that I went to elementary school with. I was in the fourth grade with this kid. And I remember we used to like to wear these cool surfer hats. The thing to do was to have like a little surfer hat back then. And I, you know, he came to the Starbucks that one day. He was just sitting there. I don't think he even knew who I was. OK, let me, let me talk about this for a second. This could either be one person whose head moved several times while I was drawing him, or it could be several people who sat in the same seat at the Starbucks. Because what I would do would be I would just kind of cast my gaze into a certain area, and then whoever came into that area, I flipped on the camera, which was my drawing, you know? And then when they left, I would go into drawing backgrounds and stuff like that, and then a new person would come in, I might add on to their face. OK, um, this is Starbucks, inside looking outside. And this woman actually noticed I was looking at her. And she kind of like was getting nervous and moving forward. And, and she you know, gave me this like kind of, what are you looking at glance. And this was one of the first times I realized that you have to have some sort of strategy to draw in public and, in order to not make people think you're some kind of psycho. More Starbucks drawings. That's the corner of Clematis Street and Olive. If you know the area, there's a pizza joint in there now. I don't know what was in there when I drew that. See, what would happen would be the person would leave, and since she was gone, I'd start drawing the chairs. And you could see where the chairs, those kind of metal chairs were that she was sitting in before. And it would leave the gesture underneath it. And I started getting into exaggeration, using different colors. I started to decide to explore color a little bit with the pens as well. The polo players' wives. I don't know if they were, but that was kind of what I was thinking about at the time. They sounded Argentinian. Um, this is. Uh, a pen and marker drawing at night. I was mostly doing things there in the daytime. And uh, you know, I, do, I tried to do some things at night. These, these are all, the reason why there's so much action going on in there is because people come and go. And I wasn't worried so much about depiction as I was about capturing the energy and the motion of the scene rather than depiction of a human being. I was trying to depict more their activity, action. OK, this is, um, this is the first painting I did from the Starbucks series. And what I did was I took a small panel about this big with me to the Starbucks in my backpack. And I sketched it out with a pen first, drew the whole scene with a pen, then brought it back to my studio and painted the colors in. And I started understanding that once I had all these shapes that were people, that were people in there, I started realizing that's an excuse to start playing with color, and that doesn't take much for me, but that's what I decided to do with it. This was brick wall. There's a nice brick wall in there. Laptop. Another ex example when a person left and I just drew everything else that was around there. There's pen in there that you can see kind of Sharpie markers. And then I do oil glaze on top of it to give it the, the color. OK, so this is, this is the last one of that series. Um, then I started doing things where I would, instead of just trying to draw what I saw, just like I did with the drawings, I started to get restless. And I started doing these basically influenced by contemporary art today strange juxtapositions of people so that it gives you this not sure about like is that some person far away or is he like giving the guy a lecture standing on his knee you know that one actually was done at the Starbucks in uh, Lake Worth I kind of jumped ship from they had good coffee too another one person turned their head but I decided to color it in with marker 
the same sort of thing. I just want to be alone. It's because she has the big shades on. See, what happens is, once you get into this place where you're drawn and people are moving, if you let yourself, it can become some pretty interesting things. Like the guy looks like he's holding him up with his foot, you know? And he's kind of got this long head like the guy from The Abyss, that old movie. So I just kind of threw that in there, that kind of liquid looking guy. The old matchbook trick. And the guy's doing um, origami while he's standing in a Chinese food container. <laughs> Stuff like that. Round table discussion. It's when there's a lot of people sitting together. I started to realize that just by juxtapositioning and doing good compositions that things could happen that were, that were interesting, that made sense from an artistic perspective. And that because it made sense from an artistic perspective, that was enough for me and all the other stuff that happens, like this person with three heads doing the jig on top of a scooter would be OK with me as long as it worked in the sense of the dynamic of the art. Another one with color. These, are, these marker drawings are, again, I'm starting to like explore the ideas of juxtaposition, and now I'm using color. In the late 2000s, I mean the late aughts or whatever you call them, I had gotten a new studio, so I decided to start making paintings from my drawings. And this painting is about the size, it's about that size actually, maybe it's slightly smaller, but it's done from a drawing that I did at Starbucks and then just blew it up, made a larger version. This painting is also done from a Starbucks drawing. Here's an example of how, how they look. This drawing is only probably, you know, the size of a small postcard. And then that, the painting's slightly smaller than that. And you can see I'm trying to actually capture something of the, tell me about your mother. You know, it's kind of like sitting there talking to the psychiatrist. You'll get wiser. So this just shows how I work. I, I take the drawing and then I turn it into a painting. That painting is probably six feet tall. So it's you know, an expression of, of the drawing. What I've done up to this point is kind of lead up to my animations, showing you how my drawing took me into the animation process. I use this thing right here, which plugs into a computer and I did all the drawing for the animation on this in Photoshop, which is unorthodox. People don't usually work that way. But, you know, I just have what I have in front of me and I worked with that because that's what I had. Okay, this is one of my animations. The um, soundtrack for this was done by the Storch Brothers. So it's an original soundtrack. I, I did the animation and I gave it to the, to the musicians and then they react to it. So this is about seven minutes long. But you can see my interest in line and drawing comes through in these two, I think.
Thank you.
Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, that was the first animation I made. So I learned all that while I was doing it. Uh, as you can see, though, I rely heavily on the kind of line drawing like Degas and Da Vinci and all those people. I channel that kind of energy through the drawings that I make. At least I try to take it that serious for myself. Obviously, I'm not putting myself there, but just that kind of linear quality to the work is interesting to me. I have another one like that, about that same length, and then a short one, Then we can talk about things. And I got some paintings to show you based on these animations, OK? This one's called Marginal Legends. This is also John Storch and Bill Storch, who are very good friends of mine, did the, the soundtrack for this. Stairs and stillest of thoughts. 
Often my eyelids would grow heavy and I'd grin and long for the sleep of all cowards. I made the slow ascent to the top of the bridge. It was a nice enough day out, perfect sleeping weather. As I contemplated the deep, I saw no final door. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no end of the tunnel. I did not expect resolution, merely a change. As I prepared to lean forward and plunge into the unknown, I saw something move. There was a massive cockroach by my left foot. Why was a cockroach on the top of a bridge? I'm no entomologist, one of my many flaws. Instinctively, I raised my foot to step on it, but I stopped short. He couldn't help it, he was a roach. He was just living as a roach lives. He had no worries or anxieties. He merely exists and follows the flow of the universe, content in his meager state. I slowly lowered my hand near him. He climbed up onto it and crawled up to the bicep of my cold, bare arm. We stayed that way for about 30 minutes. I thinking thoughts and feeling feelings. He simply wiggling his antennae. Then suddenly he spread his wings and flew away. He sat that way for hours. A roach would never purposely scurry under someone's heavy foot. And a roach has no one to let down. I cried. How selfish am I to expect anything from life? As if life itself isn't enough. I continued to sit there, feet dangling off the side, teetering on the edge of oblivion. Finally, I was jarred by car horns from below. I stood up slowly and cautiously made my way down the bridge and just walked home. On the way, I looked at all the cracks in the sidewalk. I noticed the interesting patterns they created, and the small yellow flowers growing between them. Thank you very much. That's uh, the second animation I ever made. This is a digital, this, this I did with a digital camera. And I used a lot of the same principles that I use in drawing. So it's not exactly a complete departure from my drawing. But I did this rock video for a band called the Cop City Chill Pillars. And they're, they have their music studio in the same area where I had my art studio. So I got to know them a little bit and um, asked them if I could try out this project with them and make a, a video for their song called Gift Shop. So this is my interpretation of their song.
<laughs> so that's my foray into digital art. So that is actually the result of about two years worth of work. It takes a long time to do one of those. The, the first animation that you saw is really only a third of it. I cut it down because I didn't want to show a super long animation, so I edited it down to about a third of its length. So the amount of time that goes into it technically is a lot of time. So now, um, into the phase where I'm at now, I'm in my studio working on paintings that are derived from stills which come from these animations. This is that bridge walker guy in the, in the Marginal Legends animation where the guy's walking across the bridge. And this painting is four feet by seven feet. And I grid off the painting and try to come as close as I can. This is where I'm at with it right now. I'm still painting on it. So you can see this is where it's at, working from the grid. I'm, I'm right about maybe at the halfway point of painting this thing. So I try to interpret by using neon colors in places and things like that to try to get color that's similar. So my painting is kind of coming out of where I went with my animation. Um, this was in the social set, that unraveling piece of hair the guy has on the ground. I, this painting is um, about four feet square. And this is, it's finished actually, and that's how it looks. It's about four feet square, so it's this real kind of expressionistic painting of, of a still. And I, but I try to, you can see that I try to interpret it as closely as I can. I, I think of it almost as a representational painting because I try to make it close to as accurate as I can. And this is that character that makes the buzzing sound when he walks and the, the, uh, has that little star thing in his chest there. This is also a oil painting. These, these are oil paintings. That painting is kind of small. I think that's it. <laughs>